Hello, this is William from Visual Components. In this video, I'm going to show you how to define rules for routing parts in a conveyor system. To get started, let's build a simple layout in a 3D world. I'll go to my eCatalog panel, and under Models by Type, I'll click Feeders, and then add an advanced feeder to the 3D world. I'll now expand Conveyors and click Visual Components, and double-click this item here called Conveyor, and this automatically plugs the conveyor into the end of the feeder in the 3D world. I'll now go to the Component Properties panel, and set the conveyor type property to be belt conveyor. I'll now go back to my eCatalog panel and do a search for a crossing conveyor. And I found this item here, so I'll double click it. And it adds the crossing conveyor to the 3D world and connects it to the end of the conveyor. Now notice we have three output ports in this crossing, so one here, one there, and one over here. So what I'm going to do, I'll copy this conveyor, and paste in a new one, and plug this copy into the end of the crossing here paste in another conveyor, and plug it into this end of the crossing, paste in another conveyor, and plug it into this end. So now I have three possible routes for parts that enter the crossing at this end here. So if we select the conveyor crossing in the 3D world, go to the Component Properties panel, you should see a section here called Routing Rule. So this will define the rules for routing parts that arrive in this component. And we can see here all the routes, so right now we're using a cyclic rule, so it will first route parts to the left interface, it will then route parts to the right interface, and then route them straight ahead, and the cycle will repeat itself. So in this case, left is referring to this conveyor, this output port here, this is the right interface or the right route, and this is the straight out route. So if I run the simulation, parts should go left, right, and straight ahead. There we go. And the cycle should repeat itself. And it does. Let's reset our simulation and see what happens when we delete one of these routes here. So using the cyclic rule, let's delete the left route. So now the cycle is just go right, then send a part straight out, and then send the part right again and straight out and just keep on repeating. So if we run the simulation, it should ignore this left conveyor and just route parts here and then straight out and then repeat the cycle. And it does. Let's reset our simulation and use a different routing rule. So in the routing rule section here, select the rule, then we're going to change its type. So if we set this to be capacity rule, notice we get a prompt saying that if you change this, you're going to undo all the other connections and rules you already set up for it. So this is referring to these child rules or these child connections here. I'm going to click yes, and notice I'm now left with a capacity rule, but no connections or no rules. So let's go and add a new connection and route a part left if there's capacity there add another connection, and route it straight out. So I have two possible exit points, and if there is capacity at this left route here, it's going to keep on routing parts there. So until there is no capacity at this left route, it's going to ignore this route here. And let's see how that happens. So if I start the simulation, this conveyor, its path probably has a lot of capacity, so we can see what's happening. It's just using this left route because there's always capacity here, so it's not routing parts there. So this is the difference between a capacity rule and a cyclic rule. To show a difference here, let's reset the simulation and add some type of block here to stop parts from leaving this conveyor. So eventually, it won't have capacity for any more parts. Let's go to our eCatalog panel, and under Models by Type, click Processors, and add this item here called End Block. Let's now plug this end block to the conveyor, and notice I'm attaching it to the conveyor's path, so using the PMP command I can move it to the end of the conveyor's path here. And if I start the simulation, let's see what happens. So it's still using this left conveyor here, or this left route, and notice something else, that it's not smart enough to recognize that there's parts accumulating on this conveyor's path, so it still wants to use that left route. To fix that, let's select the conveyor here, and then go to the Component Properties panel and change the conveyor capacity to be 5. So now only 5 parts or 5 components can be on this conveyor's path at one time. So if I start the simulation, once we get 5 parts on this conveyor, you know, it won't use this left route anymore. It will then start routing parts straight ahead. So now there's 4, 5, and there we go. And notice it's still using this route. There's no more capacity here. Let's reset the simulation. And instead of using a capacity rule, let's use a fixed rule, so we kind of have a fixed route for parts. I'll select the conveyor crossing in the 3D world, and then go back to its routing rule. And we want to change the capacity rule, so I'll select it here, 
then change its type to be fixed rule. And notice this will undo all the child rules or connections, so I'll click yes. And now let's add a connection for this fixed rule. So if a part arrives from our straight in interface in the crossing, let's send it straight out. So a part will arrive here, let's just send it right here, or straight ahead in this route. So if we start the simulation, it's going to ignore the left route and the right route and just put them straight ahead, and it's doing that. Now a fixed rule is a little bit more complex and robust than what I'm presenting, so let's reset the simulation. And for our fixed rule, we are going to get parts straight in from that interface, but instead of putting them straight out, let's use another rule. Let's use a cyclic rule. So now we have this rule nested inside this rule here. So this is a child rule. I'll select the cyclic rule, but notice it has no connections or other rules. So let's add a connection. And let's use our left route. Add another connection to use straight out. Add another connection to route parts out that right interface. So if we run the simulation now, the fixed rule is that if a part is arrives from this interface, it'll go left, straight ahead, right, and then the cycle will repeat itself. Great, that's what's happening. And we can see it listed here. So the fixed rule, if a part comes in from that interface, use this cycle and just keep on repeating. Let's reset the simulation. But we should be careful because if I start the simulation again and make it go super fast, we're using a cyclic rule to route parts to the left side, so eventually this conveyor won't have any capacity, and let's see what happens. So now we have four parts, five parts, and the cycle is now looped back, and this conveyor no longer has capacity, but it's still trying to route the part there. So what we can do, we can add another rule to our route. Let's reset the simulation, go back to our routing rule here, and the issue is happening with this left route here, so let's select it. Let's actually edit it here and set it to be a capacity rule. And then we want to edit this rule, so I'll select it here. Let's add the connection to be left. And this might be a bit confusing for you, so what we're doing, we have a fixed rule that states that if a part arrives from this interface in the conveyor crossing straight in, then we're going to use a cyclic rule to determine where that part should go. So in the cyclic rule, which you can see here, we're first using a capacity rule to see if we can route a part left. If we can't, it's going to go to this next cycle here to route them straight out. It will then route the parts right, and then the cycle will loop back and test again if we can route the part left. Let's now see how this route works. So we start the simulation. Here come the parts. There is capacity left, so the part goes there. Straight ahead, right, and the cycle is now repeating itself. And eventually we're going to have five parts here, so there won't be any capacity. And we can see the cycle still works. So there's no capacity, so it then goes to the next available in that cycle, which is straight out. The part goes right, the cycle repeats itself. Great. Let's reset the simulation. And I'm now going to show you how a percentage rule works. So let's go back to our routing rule. And I'm going to select the top-down rule here, and this will undo everything down here. So if I change the type to be percentage rule, I click yes. Notice I undid all that work. Let's now use a percentage rule to route parts to straight out. And to do that, we'll basically create that 100% of all parts that arrive at the conveyor crossing, we're going to route them through this interface. So if we start the simulation, the part should come in and just go straight out. So we're not going left, they're not going right, because 100% of the parts should go to this connection here. Let's reset and see if we can change this a bit. Let's add another connection. And instead of 100%, let's use 50-50. So 50 parts should go straight out and 50 parts should go right. So if we start the simulation again, part is going through straight out and right, but notice it's not using this left route here, this left conveyor. And let's now see how we can use the properties of parts to route them in the conveyor system. So with the conveyor crossing selected, I'll go to the routing rule here. I'll select the top route for the percentage rule and change its type to be a string table rule. I'll click yes. And now I can define the variable or property in the component I want to test for the route. So in this case, I know the parts that are being created by the advanced feeder have a property called product ID. So if I run the simulation and stop it real quick, 
and select this cube, you can see it has a property called product ID, which is 222. This white product here, it has a product ID of 333. Now there is a red part that's also created by the events feeder. By default, it has a product ID of 111. So what we can do, we can say that if a product has an ID of 111, let's send it left. If it has a product ID of 222, let's send it straight ahead. If it has a product ID of 333, send it right. Now, what happens if a part or a component does not have this product ID property? Well, you can define a default route for it. So if we go back to our conveyor crossing, and let's reset the simulation. Let's look at the routing rule. And we're checking if a component has this product ID property. And if it doesn't, by default, let's send it straight out. But let's add a connection here that if the value is 111, send the part left. If the value is 222, send the part straight out. If the value of that variable is 333, send it to the right. So if we start the simulation, let's see the cube go straight ahead because it has a product ID of 222. These red parts. Let's select them in the 3D world. You can see they have a product ID of 111. Now eventually we get into that same issue where it wants to route the part left, but there's no capacity here. So what we can do, let's reset the simulation. Let's create a capacity rule for that product ID of 111. So I'll select a conveyor crossing, go back to its routing rule. And for this product ID variable in the component, if it's 111, instead of just saying make it go left, let's use a capacity rule. And if we expand the route, we can see there's that nested rule. So I'll select the capacity rule, add a connection for it to go left. But if there's not any capacity at the left route or the left interface, let's go ahead and send it right. So once again, we're using a string table rule to check a component for this variable here called product ID. Now, if it doesn't have that variable, by default, the part will go straight out. If it does, and its value is 111, we're using a capacity rule to see if we can route the part left. If there's no capacity there, we're going to route the part right. We're then also checking that if the product ID is 222, we're sending it straight out. If it's 333, we're sending it right. So let's first slow down our simulation and see how this happens. So here comes the cube. It has a product ID of 222, so it goes straight out. This white component here has a product ID of 333, so it goes right. Now these red parts here, they're going left, so we know that their product ID is 111, and eventually there'll be five red parts. There's no capacity, so now the red parts are going right. So we know that our routing rule is working. So let's select the conveyor crossing again, and you can see it's using the logic we have here. All right, let's reset the simulation. And the last thing I want to show you in the video is that you can set a routing rule to just use one route only. Now to do that, select the conveyor crossing, go to its routing rule, and we don't need any of this information anymore, so I'm going to delete everything, and then set the empty route to use that left connection. So now, any part that's received by this conveyor crossing is just going to go left or out of this interface here. So if I start the simulation, we can see that parts are just going left. Now eventually there'll be no capacity, so we're gonna have you know a bottleneck here. And yep, so the parts can't go there. So we probably wanna say that in the case of emergencies, let's just route all the parts straight out. Click yes, run the simulation again, and now the parts are just going whoop, straight out that way. All right, this concludes the video. If you have any more questions, please feel free to visit our forum at forum.visualcomponents.com, and I hope you have a wonderful day.